Welcome to our introduction to Aristotle. In The Great Conversation, we are treating a couple of chapters from the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, Aristotle is perhaps the greatest intellect in the, the history of thought. Uh, he is part of this unbelievable chain of uh, philosophers that begins with Socrates. To, to have the three greatest philosophers, perhaps, all in a row, uh, teacher, disciple, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, it, it is just one of the great uh, wonders of, of history. And we're, we're very grateful that, that these men existed. We have the famous painting from Raphael, The School of Athens, which um, sums up, right, the, the basic thrust of Plato's thought is, is upwards in the heavens. And you have Aristotle, his concern is horizontal. It is on this world, on this earth that he is focused. He was born 384 and lived till 322 BC. Around the age of 18, he found his way to uh, Plato's academy. And he was born as Stagira, which, so he's not an Athenian, unlike Socrates and Plato. He, uh, Stagira was in the northern part of the Greek world, Thrace, um, right next to Macedon. And his father was a physician, actually. Nicom and Nicomachus was a uh, court physician to one of the kings of Macedon, and that will be very important in uh, a later fact we will talk about in Aristotle's life. He came to uh, Plato's academy and studied with Plato for 20 years, it seems. So uh, this, this is a man we often set against Plato as if these two had... Uh, opposing systems, but in fact, uh, Aristotle spent a very long uh, apprenticeship in, in the milieu of Platonic thought. And that, that's, that's easy to trace, that, that some of the things that Aristotle is most known for, we can find, for instance, analyses of a virtue in the Gorgias of Plato that, that clearly resonate in the ethics. So uh, that it, it shouldn't be surprising that this long apprenticeship happened. Around uh, 343, because of this connection of Aristotle's family with the court of Macedon, King Philip II of Macedon called Aristotle to become the tutor of the man we will uh, come to know as Alexander the Great. And that this is one of the great conjunctions in history also. So when Alexander was about uh, 13, uh, Aristotle became his tutor and for maybe seven years until the accession of Alexander to the throne in 336. Uh, uh, this is, um, he was formed by this great intellect, Aristotle. There are legends that on his expeditions, um, Alexander would send back samples, by, um, botanical and other samples for uh, Aristotle's researches. On the death of Alexander in 323, the anti-Macedonian faction uh, in Athens brought up charges, uh, capital charges against Aristotle of impiety, just like Socrates. And as the famous saying goes, uh, Aristotle, in order that the Athenians not sin against philosophy twice, he fled. Um, he did not take the hemlock as Socrates did and fled to Euphia. So the Macedon anti-Macedonian sentiment had to do with the fact that King Philip and his son Alexander uh, brought the Greek mainland under one uh, empire. Uh, even though the Macedonians thought of themselves as part of the Greek world, that was a very touchy subject. They, they weren't thought of as part of the Greek world in an obvious sense by the other Greek city-states. They certainly resented having their liberty um, compromised by an empire. Philip and Alexander thought of themselves as, as super Greeks and uh, they were trying to get the kind of power base necessary to attack the Persian Empire to settle that old score. And Alexander would in fact carry out this project and create, though short-lived, one of the, the, the greatest empires the history, uh, history has ever seen. It, it would conquer Persia and Alexander would go all the way to India. So truly a multi-civilizational empire and would spread Greek culture, uh, Greek culture that he had learned from Aristotle, 
it would spread it across vast civilizations, back across Mesopotamia, right, across the cradle of civilization, uh, west coming back uh, to, to the east, as it were. Uh, the great ambition of Alexander was this, this kind of syncretism to join Greek and Persian in a, um, in, in a grand multi-civilizational synthesis, but uh, Alexander took on a feeling for um, being treated like a Persian potentate, so he was always resented in the, in the Greek world, which always valued liberty. That was the thought um, that the Greeks stood for liberty against Persian autocracy. So on the death of Alexander, uh, scores were going to be settled and Aristotle fled and died soon after leaving Athens. Before his departure though, and after he had left the post of tutor of Alexander the Great, he came back to Athens and formed the, the Lyceum. So this was a second school after the academy uh, in, the, in a temple of Apollo. It was a gymnasium, a sanctuary, and it was the, the seat of a school that would become known as the peripatetic, seems seemingly having to do with the habit of Aristotle's teaching while walking, peripateo, um, to walk. Peripatetic school of thought as opposed to the academic, supposedly uh, platonic school. So all of that unfolded in the shadow of empire. Alexander the Great had taken over. The Lyceum is being consolidated, it's being created in the shadow of this, this rising Macedonian Greek uh, empire that's that's it's going uh, east. There is no question that Aristotle has a different approach, I think, than Plato and certainly than Socrates to philosophy. There is something we need to think about. What are the commonalities? In what way is Socratic uh, perplexity still there in Aristotle? I think that's worth really struggling to try to see because at the beginning of uh, the metaphysics, which I quoted a few uh, introductions ago, Aristotle is clear that the desire to know sets up wonder, and part of wonder, intrinsic to wonder, is the sense that I don't know. So that's that Socratic moment. He knows it's there. But uh, however one thinks Plato's system, how systematic it is, whether it's, it, it, it leaves behind the Socratic um, uh, pathos, uh, Aristotle certainly does. He has a positive philosophy. It is very system, I mean, it is systematic. It's as systematic as any philosophy we've got in the history of thought. Uh, he, we only have a fraction of his writings, unfortunately, and it seems that what we've got are lecture notes, and they're lecture notes that would have been worked over by his uh, successors at the, at the Lyceum. So we, it's very hard to try to get at the voice of Aristotle. Uh, in any case, he didn't think that it was necessary for philosophy to have rhetorical flourish. He did not treat philosophical language the way Plato did. Plato believed in a literary thickness, as it were, to um, his writing. And again, there's a big difference here. Socrates never wrote anything. Plato wrote dialogues. What we've got from Aristotle are, are um, systematic treatises. So these are just different ways of approaching philosophy, and that's, that's just worth thinking about. In, put these in comparison to Parmenides with his epic poetry. And um, Heraclitus with his aphorisms. There are different ways to be philosophical. What Aristotle does, no matter what, though, no matter how positive his thought is, and it's very positive, that is, he's giving a teaching. It's very systematic. Um, one value, though, is it can teach you how to maybe live a good life. And that's, that's the question uh, his ethics certainly puts in front of us. Is there an excellent way to live one's life? And of course, that has everything to do with our question in the Great Conversation, how should we live? Is there an excellent way? Aristotle is quite sure there is a, an optimal way to be human, to live a human life. And that's the question that is pursued in the Nicomachean Ethics. That desire to know that Aristotle himself identifies as the beginning of philosophy, that eros, really, it is, it's, it's an eros to, to just learn. This man clearly just loved to learn. He loved to discover new things. I could call it a cosmic intelligibility. He just thought the world, what he saw in the world was, was, was uh, patterns of order. And these, this is just a list of a few of the subjects he treated, physics, rhetoric, logic, zoology, botany, psychology, astronomy, tragedy, 
epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, politics, constitutional history, and so on and on and on. I mean, he has these, he, uh, he has a chronology of the Olympic and Pythian victors that was important for establishing historical dating. And he just loved to research. He loved to think. And so even if it is very systematic, there's clearly this Socratic, what is it, um, drive. I mean, he always is thinking. So there, there is at least one Socratic element. He's always restlessly thinking. And he was quite convinced that that was essential to living an excellent life. For him, an excellent life was a life lived according to logos, or what we would call reason. A life lived according to that which is highest in us, that which is uh, correspondent to cosmic intelligibility, right? The order of being and the order of our intelligence, they, they, they match up for Aristotle. And he's excited every time he sees it, right? He's, he's studying plants and the structure of plants, and he's excited. And scientists can speak still to this, you know, how, how exciting it is to discover something. Or um, it, it's just anybody who, who's known what it means, why, why any of us are participating in the great conversation, right? We, we, get, we get happy because of... Um, the, the beauty of being. In the Nicomachean Ethics, we have a research into the that for the sake of which we do everything else. Aristotle is asking the question, why basically we get up in the morning? What, what is it that gets us going? What is it that we're striving for? Could it be wealth, pleasure, power as an end for all of our actions? And he, he's pointing out, you know, the, that for the sake of which we're actually doing, the, acquiring wealth or, or pursuing pleasure, it's this thing we, call, we all call happiness. And in Greek, that's eudaimonia, that is to have a good daimon, to have a good spirit or genius or divinity. I mean, it's a very complicated word that's, that's very kind of... Um, uh, it's translated in a most pedestrian way when we talk about happiness, but to have a what a good spirit That happiness is what we all want we want to feel a little above The normal every day right that there's a daimonic something higher And it's it's something where we feel it when we're doing something well So when we're doing anything excellent you know, we feel that flow, we feel that mastery, the spezzatura, that's the kind of, that's life, that's, that's life at its maximum. Well, Aristotle is saying that there's a way of not just doing one or other activity well, and excellence there, but there's a way of just being human in an excellent way. And if you do that, you're going to be happy, you're going to have a, a good spirit. And that's the, uh, it's a life lived according to logos or life lived activity of the soul in accordance with virtue throughout the whole of one's life. That's the, the definition he's going to give. And then he'll, he'll spend much of the ethics going over what virtue is. As we know, virtue is a mean between extremes, right? Courage is neither recklessness nor uh, cowardice. It's something in between. And it's something that also isn't um, merely spontaneous. It's something that is connected to logos. We have a sense of what is appropriate. We can, we could uh, formulate it if we had to, right? It's something about the intelligibility of, of existence that we can, we can speak about. Virtue depends on our actions making sense in this world. That cosmic intelligibility is still there. And one of the most moving chapters we have, he's got two books of the ethics devoted to friendship. And as he says, uh, who, without friends, who would want to live? Whatever one wants to say, maybe, well, in the shadow of empire, we have a more kind of imperial philosophy because he is teaching. He's teaching a system as opposed to the Socratic and I think platonic way of, of just keeping everything a little uh, in tension. But regardless, Aristotle is always very humane in his teaching. It's, it's a very, it's, it's, he's saying things that are accessible. Uh, we can test them out in our own lives. If it is the case that many of the scientific researches which he, he advanced in a way that just is so far beyond what the pre-Socratics were doing, I mean it's the same natural philosophy, but he's, he's just advanced into this, he, he's expanded knowledge single-handedly in a way that 
I don't know if one can say any other human has ever done. I mean, he brought everything to another quantum level. A lot of that scientific research, of course, is, is passe now. But it, we think about the way he analyzed it. Is that passe? Do we think his an analysis of the structure of the soul, is that, um, does that hold water anymore? Do we think his psychology is, it, or, is plausible? Well, I don't know. I mean, that, that's the, the, one of the great debates and we'll see in, in coming uh, semesters of the great conversation. The moderns really hated Aristotle because they thought he was holding back the uh, innovative power of the modern spirit. But, and, and maybe it is the case that one could be too enchanted by the system that Aristotle is just laying out and it can be taken dogmatically and I mean, for instance, the Catholic world I come from, Aristotle is, is the big one, right? And that has to do also with the, the history of Western Europe. We, we know that with the split, split of Western and Eastern Roman Empire, the Greek speakers went the way of Plato, first of all. They were Platonists. But the, the West had Aristotle. Uh, Plato was lost. Most of his writings were lost to Western Europe for, for, until the, the Renaissance, really. But Aristotle came in through the Arabs. Aristotle mattered to the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians, right? It, it gave a way of, and it, and it gave a way of these religious um, thinkers to, to keep grounded in the world. It was a very beautiful thing because Aristotle was there to give natural intelligibility a, a purchase, a license for, for religious thinkers to hold on to, a way of showing the, the, uh, the wisdom of God. All of that has come under fire in, in the modern world. And yes, maybe we want us to say, you know, that desire to know needs to be very Socratic. We, we can't hold, even someone as beautiful as Aristotle, maybe his, his account of the soul has to have room, be made to listen to modern ways of approaching these things, which is different. Maybe we can, we can harmonize all of it if we have the energy of thought to do so. I still think that would be Aristotelian spirit because I still think that in the if the the deepest fact about Aristotle is his desire to know that eros of thinking. Well, I think he's still Socratic, and uh, that's why I think if we take his systematic uh, writings in that spirit, we will continue to be moved. We'll continue to be taught, but we'll also continue to explore and expand the the reach of human intelligence in a way that would make her subtle happy.